the art arm. Discovering the foods popularized during the Civil War era has been a road trip dream of mine for years. Oh yeah. Following in the footsteps of General Sherman's army through Georgia. Oh, look at that. Oh my. Prepare to get messy. Where wild food has nourished families for generations. Rabbit hunt all day and cool hunt all night. <laughs> Babies like a stray little piece of fur is a sign of freshness. And disregarded ingredients evolved into an iconic American food culture. A little bit of warning if you're a first timer, just don't eat the toes. <laughs> <laughs> eat, brothers, get in there, eat, eat. I'm Andrew Zimmern, and this is Bizarre Food. Civil War pitted pro-Union northern states against 11 southern Confederate states. We all know the Union victory ended slavery and solidified the federal government's sovereignty over the states, but the Civil War's untold story is one of resourcefulness, trumping hardship. Soldiers faced with a scarcity of rations and the fear of starvation relied on creative food solutions to survive. At the same time, African-American slaves resourcefully took undesirable bits and scraps and laid the groundwork for what I would argue is our true national cuisine. Along Georgia's antebellum trail between Macon and Athens, you'll find people in places that have deep roots in the Civil War. Driving along the southern half of the antebellum trail, you'll find towns that were spared major ruin during General Sherman's scorched earth march to the sea. That's why it's easier to find pockets of communities who still practice food traditions from that era. During the Civil War, the Macon City Hall became the temporary state capital of Georgia. The town housed a Union prison camp and cannon factory. This is the backside of Cannonball House, which got its name because it took a cannonball during the Battle of Dunlap Hill. And like most houses of the time, the cooking was done in a separate house that is 100% original. I want to see how the penultimate Civil War food is made, and this is one of the only places you can find it. Kelly Banks is a volunteer living historian and Civil War reenactor. Her ancestors fought in the war between the states. I'm assuming this is hardtack. It is, and hardtack actually goes back later than the time of the Civil War. It's basically indestructible bread. All it is is just flour and salt and, of course, water. Hardtack was cheap to make, easy to transport, and can last for decades. Confederates ate a lot less of the hard cracker than northern soldiers due to flour shortages across the south. Now this is called a biscuit break. Mm -hmm. This is actually a period tool. You would go through here and roll it out. See, Start. this was the day where everything was real cooking. Oh yeah. You know. And everything tastes so much better. Well, everything was natural. Everything was And natural. everything was seasonal and everything was local. Mm -hmm. And of course she had the square. This signature square shape is pierced with 16 nails to make holes in the dough that helps pull out the moisture as it bakes. This delayed the bread from spoiling and growing mold. Hear it? It's hard. Oh yeah. It's like a perfect giant saltine. Exactly, that's basically what it is. That can chip your teeth off and last forever. Ten miles east of Macon, a monument marks the Battle of Griswoldville, which took place on November 22, 1864. More than 500 Confederate lives were lost. Every year, volunteers gather at the camp of the unknown soldier to remember the dead. They dress, speak, and model behavior of Civil War soldiers. Permission to enter? Permission granted. Who are you? Andrew Zimmern of the New York 3rd Infantry. A deserter. <laughs> Do you want to go to Andersonville? I don't, 
In nearby Andersonville, Georgia, the Confederate Army held 45,000 Union prisoners of war. Soldiers starved in prison camps. My odds of survival are better on the front lines. Do you want to swear an oath to the Confederacy? I would do so for today. Can you uh, write? I can. Thank you, Mark. You are now a member of the 16th Georgia Company G. Your number will be 16 GAG 369. These men and women are living historians. They eat Civil War survival foods that kept folks alive in the most severe conditions. The boot camp ribbing is the fun part. You hereby swear allegiance to the Confederate States of America? I hereby swear my allegiance to the Confederate States of America to hereby serve to the end of this war or as such time as I steal all your secrets and run back to my camp. Corporal, <laughs> make sure you put two guards on this man. Issue him some uniform. This all came out of the dead man's pile. The dead man's pile was a real thing. Salvaged clothing from the fallen were issued to new recruits. The Confederate Army uniform was a hodgepodge. Soldiers rarely matched. The South had the cotton, but not the manufacturing plants of the North. We ought to put him in the quartermaster's corps. As well fed as he looks, he can probably cook. You look natural now, anyway. Corporal, carry this new recruit out to drill him. Thank you, sir. Thank you all right. Follow me, recruit. Yes, sir. Thank you, Colonel. Remember what the manual says. A new recruit is to be considered to have the knowledge of a rock and that you act thereupon. I think I've seen rocks smarter than him. Attention, company. Soldiers carried everything they needed to survive. Water in their canteen, rations in their haversack, their weapon, and ammunition. Fire. Tear cartridge, charge round, draw rammer. I've hunted my whole life, and I'm proficient with the whole range of weapons. This gun was heavy and incredibly awkward to handle at first. Return rammer. Private, if you can't load and aim and fire any quicker than that, you're going to be dead. In the hands of a skilled marksman, the Springfield and the Enfield rifles were deadly and brutal weapons capable of inflicting historically unrivaled damage. Fire. Both weapons used a soft lead bullet called mini balls. They caused devastating damage to bone and soft tissue. Union blockades choked off supplies to the South, and hunger forced soldiers and homemakers to experiment. I portray a woman on the home front, mm -hmm. and what I have is a lot of substitutions after the Union soldiers came in and took everything. One of them, was right the, there's the sweet potato mm -hmm. coffee. Coffee was the soldier's treasured beverage. Union soldiers were rationed 36 pounds a year, while the blockade forced Confederates to concoct alternative brews. What are some of the other substitutions? Okra. They would use carrots. Mm -hmm. They would use potatoes, beets, mm -hmm. uh, any, anything edible. How toasty do you get the uh, I'm going to turn them a little potatoes. bit more brown. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. don't wanna, I don't want them black. I just right. want them brown. Sure. I grew the sweet potato myself. Sun dried. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. Confederates were so desperate for the black tonic, soldiers were known to call a temporary truce on the front lines to trade tobacco for coffee beans. Now this is working. I just need to mash these up a little. Kids, don't try this at home. Always unplug your grinder before you put your fingers in. I have much keener appreciation for my morning cup of joe. Looks good. Oh, gosh. It's now... All 
of the tartness comes through in the dried ground sweet potato that you do not get when you just roast the sweet potato and eat it. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. <laughs> it's very nice to have the comforts of home out mm -hmm. here on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know a little secret, but you have to promise not to tell anybody. All right. I'm the Union spy. Oh, dear. Food and lack of it was one of the many reasons the Confederates were ultimately defeated. Fall out and prepare to draw rations. Soldiers had to make their own food from the meager rations they received every three days. First man up, draw rations. After one of you guys. Oh, no, 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 sir. You're new. The food's that bad, huh? Don't worry, you'll figure it out. What you gonna put it in, sir? What am I gonna put it in? Cut off. Of course. Wait a minute, Corporal. He ain't identified himself to draw rations yet. Set up a name and a number, sir. Uh, Andrew Zimmern. Zimmer Andrew. Uh, G-A-G-3 something something. <laughs> I'm the new guy. Next man. <sighs> Zimmern Andrew O U eight one two. Wrong. We got five minutes till rationing the issue is over. Zimmern, Andrew, are you over 18? If so, you and me behind the woodshed. <laughs> <laughs> That's our boy. Issue him right. Issue him right. Ooh, beans. What is that? Salt pork, rice, and a piece of sweet potato. Now, to figure out what to make with this, Assuming I get a chance. Are you saying this is my last meal? Without a doubt. <laughs> Close of the Civil War, from November to December 1864, Union General William T. Sherman led 60,000 troops on a total warfare campaign from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia. The Confederates who fought here were from right around here. They were literally fighting for their home. The Georgia militia put up the first fight against Sherman's men. <laughs> 10 miles east of Macon at Griswoldville. The Union Brigade, Infantry Brigade, came up and they got on this hill. All of a sudden, there's 4,000 Confederate infantry down there coming out of the tree line at them. So this is one of the few places that they actually made a stand and drew a line. They did. These were not really uh, veteran soldiers. These were militia, which were the home guards. I'm here to experience how a Confederate soldier survived, according to descendants and history buffs like Wayne Dobson. Reenacting Civil War life is a family affair for the military veteran, his wife Brenda, and daughter Kelly. They use the term brother against brother, and certainly we were countrymen. We're so vastly different. Yeah. That doesn't mean we need to kill each other. I've marched fired my weapon, set up my tent, and now it's time to cook my skimpy rations. So, Corporal, what do I do with my food that's in my hat? So we can put in some poke bags in your haversack all right. and just get it for later. More likely than not, the men ate up all three days right then for yep. two reasons. They were hungry, and two, they didn't know if they were going to live three more days. The only fresh meat that rank-and-file soldiers got was what they shot in the wild or confiscated from citizens. This is what's left of the last hog he had. Put it over there on the fire. That'll make good eating for the officer's staff. As shadows grow long on the battlefield, we soak in the heat around the cooking fire, thankful for another day of living, wondering if tomorrow is our last. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. I served from 1971 to 1974. Uh, my daddy fought in World War II as an artilleryman. The biggest fear of a soldier is not being killed or wounded. The biggest fear of a soldier is lying in an unmarked grave and being forgotten. Americans on both sides were fighting for what they believed in. We have to honor their memory. 
calm moments like this, you'd almost think we have a chance tomorrow. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Soldiers cooked in small groups called messes. They shared cooking pans and took turns preparing food like skilly galley. This is skilly galley. You can try to stomach this. Pass that around. It's a hard tack that's been beat, crushed, mm -hmm. soaked in uh, coffee or boiling water, and then fried up in grease. Sounds fantastic. Oh, yeah. This has all of the texture of burnt crumbs and all of the flavor of a swine's mouth. It works right in there with the four basic food groups. Yeah. Beans, bacon, whiskey, and lard. The pork roast is ready. You, you cut it up. Do you pass it around like a lollipop? Oh, look at that. What do, what do you usually eat this with, just by itself? Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Salt, pork, smoke, and fire. Feels getting better than that. We're not trying to say what was right or wrong. We're just trying to show how it happened. So how does wearing Civil War garb and eating pork fat even come close to what soldiers endured nearly 160 years ago? There's two rules in warfare. Rule number one is young men die. Rule number two, it's only God can change rule number one. Well, in a way, it doesn't. But I found this practice, some call it a hobby, others an obsession, is a way to start a dialogue about the lessons of the past. I thought I would share something with you guys. You've eaten hardtack that you all have made, but this right here, wrapped in a beautiful silk, is something you'll never eat again or get to see again. I'm gonna put my glasses on and read you the 102-year-old note that's inside this. Granddad's Civil War cracker given to his granddaughter, Catherine, in 1914. Wow. This is a real piece of hard tack from the Civil War. Oh, man. Don't do that. Oh, we're eating it. Oh. That's like breaking the whole yeah. story. <laughs> How often do you get to share food? You can stare at it all you want in a box, or we can break it up and pass it around. And as someone who's eaten 3,000 year old butter, 3,000 year old butter. Oh, God. I can tell you that eating it is better than staring at it. Still stays fresh. <laughs> no, go grab a piece. Pass around, brother. Pass around. Man. I'm honored. I am honored. That's a piece of living history right there. Tastes like it. <laughs> Doesn't it, though? It's a little stale, but it'll work. Yeah. Not a spot of mold on it, and that thing's a beauty. Oh, yeah. It makes it different from what they issued them troops because everything they had had a spot of mold and a bug. Along Georgia's antebellum trail, Civil War history is very much alive. Back in Macon, one local establishment is proving the most unloved parts of the pig taste the best. And for dessert, <laughs> those are pig ears and pig teeth. Oh, how I do wish that I could be at home now. I've had nothing to eat since breakfast and no telling when we will get rations. One of the great things that happened in the 19th century was the creation of what we now call soul food, the comfort food made from the scraps of everything that turns out to be, in my opinion, the greatest of all the American food cultures. Silly Lily's Kitchen in South Macon has been cooking up Southern soul food classics from scratch for the past six years. You see people in orange vests? You know the food's gotta be good. 
The lunch line forms before the door even opens. Coming through. Real aficionados know the earlier you get here, the better. Latarsha Fordham cooks recipes her mama, Lily, first made in the 1950s. Now, who got the pork chop? Right here. When I hear words like, who's got the pork chop, I'm hungry. So, have you been here before? All the time. What are you going to have? I have no idea yet, but I know it's going to be good. <laughs> There's no menu, so you have to listen to what people ahead of you are ordering. And I want to start order pig. Really side order of pig's feet. Right now I'm suffering from absence soul food phobia, which is the feeling that you get when you feel that the dish you've been looking forward to the most might run out by the time you get to the cabin. Across the South, little cafeterias like this one are nicknamed meat and threes because you get a meat choice with three sides. Turkey neck and oxtail. Okay. Can I get a little bit of both over rice? Yeah. And my sides will be uh, greens and mac and cheese. Okay. Did you say you have fried chicken dark quarters? Yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. This is seven pounds of food. At least. I mixed it up and did a three meat and two. Oxtails and gravy, turkey necks over rice, mac and cheese, greens with fat back, fried chicken. The cornbread muffin doesn't count. That just comes with real collards. That liquid is half the reason to order collard greens. Married in a cook pot with smoked hocks, bacon, or fat back, greens with pot liquor is the essence of honest Southern cooking. Hey, my mama recipes. She said they bliss recipes. The cooking styles originated when slaves got access to cuts of meat no one in the big house wanted. Add some vegetables from the garden, cooking techniques from Western Africa and the Caribbean, and you get this. That oxtail is just absolutely perfect. It's falling off the bone, but not falling apart. Mm. Fetch that turkey neck. You just eat it like corn on the cob. Look at this. In the turkey gravy are tiny little dumplings. What I'm really impressed by is how different all the saucing is. It's all in the juice. It is all in the juice. <laughs> I like my food wet. Well, I did good oh. this in your plate there, Lemma. Well, oh, that's how God. I like mine to wet. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for dessert, pig ears and pig's feet. This is one of life's great textural foods. A little bit of warning if you're a first timer, just don't eat the toes. <laughs> Mm. It's like a sweet, sour, spicy, Creole chili thing going on there. <laughs> I don't have a problem calling this soul food, but that name came along way after this food started getting cooked. It's blessing food. The people, the food, I just enjoy it all. Because the look on your face when everyone was ordering uh, you were so excited. I know. And you can just feel the love all the way down the line. Thank you. And it gets you hungry. Yeah. <laughs> the traditions bound to African-American culinary identity grew to become what we regard today as the essential part of Southern cooking. But mostly I just call it blankety-blank delicious. This is the Antebellum Trail, and Sherman came through here in 1864. We're in Eatonton, about halfway between Macon to the south and Athens to the north. And a lot has changed since then, but one thing that hasn't is the locals' taste for squirrel. Gray tree squirrels have been hunted as long as people have roamed the woods of northern Georgia. They're going to have fun today. Doug Solomon grew up hunting raccoon and possum at night and rabbit and squirrel during the daylight hours. His dad taught him, and it's a skill Doug passed on to his four kids. 
For him, it's an optional food source, but Civil War soldiers survived by hunting small game when they could. I want to teach them how to get what they need. They ain't got to put food on the table. Roscoe is a mixed breed of walker hound and mountain feist. He's trained to sniff out squirrel. Yeah, but y'all hold up. Be looking for the squirrel. Y'all spread out. Gray squirrels are found throughout the eastern United States. They were eaten by soldiers, slaves, and civilians during the Civil War era. When the dog barks up a tree, he's found one. I think that squirrel up there is just laughing at us. He's hunkered in. Good job. Oh, nice shot. Good boy. You're rough. We would have liked a headshot, but sometimes that's not always available. Did you get five the other day? Yeah, six actually. Six? When eating wild things, you risk biting off more than you can chew. And that's the part my kids didn't like when they were growing up. Which part? <laughs> They're <funny. laughs> Along Georgia's antebellum trail, you can still find people cooking and eating foods predating the Civil War era, but popularized at the time. Good job. Nice job. A squirrel is just one of the wild things on our lunch menu. The woods surrounding Eatonton, 40 miles northeast of Macon, have provided the Ward family with ample food for generations. Doug asked us to meet for lunch at his dad Fred's barbecue restaurant called Kin or Hook. And Kin or Hook barbecue gets its name from the fact that everyone around here is either kin by blood or hooked by marriage. So one of the plantation owners fathered five black children. He granted them their freedom and gave them property. As they grew, raised families, their families raised families. Mm -hmm. And at one time, everything here was kin by blood, a hook by, by marriage. marriage. Fred and his wife, Barbara, have been hooked for 45 years. I'm not putting that on there. The pair, partner in the kitchen, Fred preps the meat while Barbara focuses on the finishing. I take real good pride in my gravy. Matter of fact, in everything I fix. The family regularly hunts, traps, and eats a variety of critters. Near the end of the Civil War, the only fresh meat soldiers got was what they could shoot in the wild. This back in the day, this wouldn't exotic. No, this was just gross. People didn't throw away anything. Right. From the chicken foot to the chicken head. Yeah. They ate it all. Fred learned to cook chicken feet and wild game by trial and error. Barbara has always been his loving guinea pig. See how it come off the bone? Oh, man. It's good rabbit. Delicious. Mm-hmm. And that's the part my kids didn't like when they were growing up. Which part? The bullets. <laughs> Stray BBs aren't an issue with fish dishes. What's cooking in here? Catfish head yeah. stew. The broth looks really rich and wild. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is. Freshwater catfish are plentiful across the South and also supplemented the meager diets of Civil War soldiers. Fred makes his version with onions and potatoes. Simple, three-ingredient cooking is typical of the mid-19th century. Taking the big bones out. That's the best part, right? All that meat from the head? Mm-hmm. That's where your flavor comes from. Yum, yum, and yummier. Deer steaks and rabbit are seasoned, floured, and deep-fried. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm about to make some rabbit gravy. And leaving all the hearts that fell off the rabbit while it was frying. The flour is going to thicken that up and make it a nice roux. Look at that cooking up already. Okay, baby. And I'm going to pour all of my feed 
seasoning, I have in this bag. Oh, that you marinated it in? Yes. Ooh. Go ahead, admit it. We just met, but you like me. I love you. <laughs> I love you too, Barbara. <laughs> The wards invited extended family and friends to join in the wild cookout. Raccoon stew, fish head soup, green beans with bacon, venison sausage, greens with smoked turkey, fried rabbit, barbecued wild boar, barbecued raccoon with sweet potatoes, braised chicken feet, rabbit gravy, and of course if you needed more, there's rice. This is some spread, Fred. If you don't eat that, that's what we got for next week. <laughs> it's hard to convince younger generations to eat critters like possum, squirrel, and raccoon. Barbara and Fred grew up on it. Barbara, I have to tell you, I've only known you a day, and you're one of the most special and unique people I've ever met. Well, thank you. Fred knows. After 75 years, you're supposed to know. <laughs> No, what he meant to say was their 45 years together have been the longest 75 yeah. years of his life. And a hundred a month. <laughs> this is the best version of some of these foods I've ever experienced. And I watch you on, t on TV, I sure do. We be eating all them things. I said, Lord, I wouldn't be eating that. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you, some people are going to be watching you working that raccoon bone and thinking the exact same thing. Aunt Helen and her 11 siblings were raised during the Depression. She later had 11 children of her own. Her family never went hungry eating wild things. That was the cleanest tasting raccoon I've ever eaten. I usually actually like mine to have a little bit of forest still left in it. That's just soaking vinegar and water. Yep, pulls all that out. I've now found a new favorite way to eat raccoon. Twice cooked and then put in the barbecue, right? To just roast up with those sweet potatoes. It almost takes on a hammy quality, like sweet, sweet ham. Sweet potato really is the best thing to accompany mm -hmm. raccoon. <laughs> Even my favorite aunt likes it that way. <laughs> Fred incorporates the squirrel meat into a rich dumpling stew. Look at that. It's like the pot pie filling of your dreams. A little bit spicy. Mmm. Beautiful little chunks of fresh pink squirrel meat. Super delicate. This is gorgeous. During the Civil War era, soldiers and civilians could always hunt small games and survive. Those who practice this style of eating wild today enjoy the hunt and know how to make it taste good. You made a plate of raccoon to go, didn't you? Exactly. <laughs> That's yours to <laughs> 30 miles southeast of Eatonton, there's yet another great southern catch to be found. Hello, fish. Just leave it to a local group of veterans to smoke the meal upright. Now, hold on. What catalog did you order this setup out of? <laughs> we keep nearly starved and get nothing but biscuit. Ain't a pity I can't get any more good vegetables or fruit or anything of that kind. On Georgia's antebellum trail, Civil War history is a living thing. Ford, march. I broke hardtack, fireside with descendants of Confederate soldiers, and devoured dishes that originated with slaves. In some cases, our country's made great strides in 150 years. In others, not so much. Despite that, all I'm reminded of is the ceaseless sacrifice made by our nation's soldiers. In that war, killing became very uh, modern, mm -hmm. you know, uh, healing had not. Right. And there were so many amputations. When a piece of soft lead the size sure. of your thumb hits you here, yeah. there's nothing left of the arm except right. just cut skin and let it go. It's brutal, and we, we think today of all of the... Uh, traumatic stress and other psychological woundings that happen to people who just witness war. War accomplishes nothing. In the past and present, veterans struggle to reacclimate to civilian life. 
Just outside the Civil War capital city of Milledgeville is a farm where veterans can walk through the emotional wounds left by battlefield experiences. Every day we lose 20 soldiers or veterans to suicide. Even more of our bravest suffer divorces, psychiatric trauma and depression. Comfort Farms is a treatment center. Part of the therapy encourages vets to embrace outdoor activities like fishing. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. John Bennett is one of the farm's biggest boosters. Oh my gracious, look at that. Jeez, John. Stop showing off with uh, that cast. I mean, honestly. Bennett is a Vietnam veteran and an active member of the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association. He helped start Comfort Farms. So, John, tell me about Comfort Farm. It's mainly a place for veterans that have some really severe cases of post-traumatic stress disorder and brought home a lot of, a lot of wounds with them. This place is there to help mend those wounds. They, they grow their own foods, they grow their own meat, and they cook just about everything on open fire. It's agrotherapy. It's a safe place great place to heal. That's what it's all about. Oh, hello, fish. Nice fish. Oh, oh, nice nice. One. Very nice. She's fat. Yeah. Whoa. That's a nice fish there. Look at oh, that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Hey, he's got hooks all in him now. Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah. That's a fish in a half. That's a beauty. <laughs> That's a largemouth? It's a largemouth. That's a stunner. Fantastic fish. <laughs> David Bates works with Comfort Farms by leading the fishing and hunting excursions that provide some of the therapy. Do you see how peaceful it is being out here fishing? It's the same way when you're hunting game. It gives you that calming spirit. Sure. It's a stage of re-entry that allows people to assimilate back into the lifestyle they love. They were here to serve. They want to serve again. Yeah, of course. So that's a lot of the premise and the base for Comfort Farms and Stag Vets. All right, let's get in. I'll go ahead and scale and pass yeah. them to you. Beautiful fish, aren't they? They are the gutted head on, right? <clears throat> gutted head on. I'm going to put them on the smoker. Comfort Farms is the brainchild of John Jackson. What's up? What's going on? Andrew, it's good seeing you. Man. Nice good to meet you. Seeing How are you? Jackson served 11 years as an Army Ranger and did six tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I knew we were going to have a party. I didn't know we were going to have a party. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. The program combines agri-science job training with therapy. Vets raise pigs, rabbits, and chickens and partner with a local group called the Dirt Farmers Association to grow vegetables. Joe Dirt owns the vegetable farm that the vets work at and is helping to start the farm's own ag facility. This is the rewards of my labors. Everything's being cooked on his lard and our vegetables. Grow your food and eat it. Grow your food and eat yeah, it. Yeah, the That's rest the of the world way. might want to try that. Yep. Well, we got to show them how. And you smoked the fish? Yes, we did. Here? Yeah, we smoked the fish on the Afghan grill. You want to see it? Yeah. All right, yeah, let's no. do it. So, uh, this is our Afghan grill. Now, now hold on. <laughs> what catalog did you order this setup out of? Afghan approved, man. Like I tell you, we took the tin and wrapped it around yeah. it. Did what we had to do to keep it in, riveted it yeah. in to kind of keep the smoke coming through. Right. We dug a pit with a yep. fire for indirect just right to kind underneath. of go in. We took a light thing yeah. that they had and put it up top just for kind of a roof, and that serves as a chimney. As long as the fire is fed, the shed will hold 200 degrees for hours. Perfect to smoke this morning's catch. 
So you just lay them in there? We put a brine on them yep. and uh, cut them down, and that's it. Throw them on there. Here you go. That's some olive oil here for you. Oh, you guys get it fancy. Oh, yeah. Um, Eat, guys. Let me coat that for you. Oh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a naturalist. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's as fine a flavor as you can put on freshwater fish. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's clean. There's my hog right there. Yeah, we uh, specialize in rare edibles down here, you know, with the uh, American mule foot and the mangalista hog. Oh, yeah, I'm dealing with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling veterans find peace in the daily routine of caring for animals. That boar is chasing Curly Sue. <laughs> Curly Sue is a mangalitsa, a rare breed prized for its high fat content and dark red meat. These are two day old? Yep, two day old. Mule foot. The mule foot is a rare American hog breed named for its non cloven hoof that looks like a mule's. These guys go back uh, to Aristotle and the Romans, and they, all they talked about was their hands. By breeding and creating a market for these delicious rare pigs, the farm hopes to supply a unique food for chefs in the region. You know, I just don't want people to buy from us because we're vets and all that kind of stuff. I, like, we want to raise extremely good food. The giant American chinchilla is another critically endangered breed the vets raise at rapid rabbit pace. What's her name? Spaz. Spaz? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Just got that. All right, Spaz. And put her up. Hold up like this. All right. There you go. Oh, a little tushy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, you put a hand on their tushy and they calm right down. <laughs> rabbit is something that is so delicious. Yeah. Lean white meat. People should be eating more of it all the time. We should be eating more of it, and um, it's such a sustainable product for uh, especially small farms. In addition to the rare pig and rabbit breeds, Comfort Farms raises goats and chickens. John hopes to build facilities for doctors and therapists on site so veterans can receive all the services they need without having to leave the farm. Which rabbit are we going to uh, eat? Ah, she's in the back right here, black chinchillas. But uh, what I like to do, Andrew, is get it wet down mm -hmm. before I even start cutting. A kitchen scissor is the greatest thing in the it's, whole world. It's the greatest thing. Check that lever out and see yeah. how. No. Oops. You're all 100% good. <laughs> Animal is super healthy. America, this is why you need to be eating more rabbits. While rabbit should be an essential addition to anyone's table, the real question is, how many veterans does it take to annihilate a roasted pig? I'm going to go over there, and that pig is going to be bones and a couple of inedible pieces of skin. soldiers fought the American Civil War. When the bloodshed ended in 1865, more than 700,000 didn't come home. Those who did struggled to rebuild their lives. The viciousness of the war left them scarred. It's a reality modern combat veterans deal with on this farm outside Milledgeville, Georgia. Imagine what those soldiers went through with that kind of brutal combat 160 years ago oh, and some of those men weren't men they were boys today more than at any time in our history we all acknowledge the toll that war takes on our volunteer soldiers 20 percent of vets from recent wars suffer from post-traumatic stress some have discovered farming keeps them balanced that's what this place is for for vets to be able to um, have that place to come and reset. The daily demands of farm life has helped veterans like John Jackson manage PTSD. He's reaching out to help others. The food they raise and eat is imperative to maintaining a healthy mind. 
Rabbit and herbs browning in the mule foot lard is about as nice a smell as you're ever gonna find. Rabbit is one of the leanest white meats and its fine fibers easily absorb seasonings. When you simmer it, that all the lard that goes back into the pot just emulsifies, just emulsifies. into the, the dish and gives it that richness. I mean, with rabbit, actually, that added fat makes it better. Yeah. So that goes right in there, and you simmer that for how long? Overnight. Because usually us vets are probably going to get hungry around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning anyway. So, <laughs> so please tell me that in this blue one is one that was started yesterday. Yes, exactly. Oh, man, oh, man. This is just fall apart delicious. Holy moly. Oh, and there's my hair, so I know it's fresh. <laughs> wow. I'm gonna need a bigger hand. <laughs> okay, this has been fantastic. <laughs> you guys are doing amazing things with the vets. <laughs> gram for gram, liver is one of the most nutrient dense mm. foods you can eat. Oh, whoever cooked this, it's a perfect blush. Look at that. Still bleeding. <laughs> well, black and blue is how you should uh, eat it, otherwise it's tough. Mm. Delicious, bro. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Remember Curly Sue, the woolly-haired lady hog being chased by the boar? She's a mangalitsa, one of the fattiest pigs in the world. The marbled meat is called the Kobe beef of pork. Most people don't understand how red pork can be. Because somebody a long time ago lied to the American people and called it the other white meat. Right. That doesn't look white to me. And why does everything have to be about color? <laughs> Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Grill those suckers up. Another rare treat is a slow-roasted American mule foot. The Combat Veterans Biker Club has been watching this one cook all day. Most hogs have the uh, split hoof, and they are, these are mule foot. They have a syndactyl hoof, and they're, they're closed. Um, there's only about 600 registered in the States and about less than 2,000 in the world. Eat, brothers. Get in there. Eat, eat. Come and eat. <laughs> That's award-winning right there, brother. My favorite piece on the hog these days just oh, wow. that last piece of the neck yeah. i mean just look at this yeah. and you get all those charry bits uh, wow is that succulent oh, yeah. and you feel your arteries scream for help <laughs> <laughs> that's when you know it's right wow yeah. that same wonderful mule foot fat gives roasted vegetables a nice crisp these are your carrots just cooked Absolutely. in the mule foot fat? Yep. yep. Mm. Oh, are these ready too? Oh, yeah. I'm assuming that plates are optional. Plates are optional. Plates are optional. Okay, good. I knew I was among my people. Yeah. If you see a little red in your pork chop, it's okay. Mm -hmm. That's cooked through. That's the color. <laughs> And big pieces of fat like that are meant to be eaten with it. Yeah. Good food is such a part of our wellness. The, the earth is healing, food is healing. We realize yeah. that. If we can have a healthy mind, clear and uncluttered, you know, then we can get back to the business of doing what we do best. A trip along Georgia's antebellum trail reminds us how the Civil War shaped our nation. Union and Confederate armies fought each other and starvation, disease, and trauma. If nothing else, the Civil War reminds us of the dangers of not looking past our differences to find the common ground that unifies us as Americans. So just remember, the next time you're riding around the Civil War battlefields of Northern Georgia, if it looks good, eat it.